It is a great honor today to be interviewing a fellow MAGD, you and I, uh, John Comis Comisi. John Comisi, and that's Italian, right? That's correct, yes. So are, were any of your parents uh, from Italy, or are you like third, fourth? Actually, yes, my dad came over. He was first, I, so, and my mom's family was already here. So I'm kind of one and a half generations. <laughs> so, so your mom was born in Italy? No, she, my dad was born in Italy. My mom was born in Pennsylvania. Okay, and, and, and your mom's Italian too? Correct, yes. Were her parents born in Italy? Yes, they were. Wow, so you're very Italian. That's a correct. <laughs> do, do you speak any of it? Very little, not as much as I would probably like to. Uh, I took it in school and we talked it in the house, but mom and dad wanted us to grow up American and not Italian, so they didn't have us learn the language from them as much as we probably should have. Yeah, well, back in the day, they thought assimilation was so important that a lot of them uh, would go out of their way not to uh, teach their kids. Like, I have a ton of Hispanic friends because I'm on the Mexican border, and so right. many of them, their parents refused to teach them, and now their kids are really bummed out that they're not bilingual. So, right. um, so I, 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 want, I want to open up with, um, we both have our MAGD. And yeah. um, so why did you set out for that goal? For, first of all, um, you know, there's a lot of kids right now listening to these podcasts that are junior, seniors in dental school. So start from the very beginning. What is an MAGD and why did you set out uh, to do that? Well, a Master of the Academy of General Dentistry is the highest award that you can receive in the Academy. Uh, it uh, basically it is the, the culmination of a great deal of study and a great deal of work that is done by, by those of us in the Academy. Uh, the Academy of General Dentistry, of course, is uh, one of the premier organizations dedicated to continuing education and the betterment of the general dentist, uh, representing it not only from an educational point of view, but also from an advocacy point of view. Uh, so years ago when I first graduated from, from dental school and was starting to work as an associate, I found out about the academy and the various educational opportunities. And so I started out practically half a year or so out of dental, out of, out of dental school and started working toward accumulating enough credit hours to receive my fellowship, exam, uh, fellowship award, uh, which I received maybe about 12 years ago. Uh, that, of course, entails 500 hours of continuing education plus passing of the fellowship examination. And then the addition of the a mastership award, as you, as you know, uh, is another 600 uh, hours of, uh, of, of CE with 400 of that being uh, hands-on, et cetera. So it's a, it's a nice uh, 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 simulation of, of things. And it's really been an, a great uh, ladder to climb and I feel really really accomplished because of it it's an award that makes me feel good about what I have been able to do uh, you know it, it just makes me feel like I have continued to become more proficient and more aware of what we in the dental profession can offer our patients so it's a really exciting opportunity to get it it was the singular best move I made coming out of dental school um, it yep. was just the singular best move. I mean, uh, and, and a lot of it was because I got to meet all the local people that are just like you. Um, you know, right. sometimes you, I, I'll never forget these. Uh, I, I don't like golf just because um, it just takes too long. I mean, door to door, it's like six hours. And it, was, it that's just, you know, no one wants to, I don't even want to eat Thanksgiving dinner for six hours. I mean, there's, uh, there's nothing I want to do for six hours. But I remember one time these, uh, these three other dentists asked me to go golf with them. And I asked a dental question before we teed off on the first hole. And this guy turned to me and said, look, we're on a golf course. We don't talk about our wives and we don't talk about dentistry. Okay, this is sacred ground. This is where we go to escape our wives and our profession. And I just thought, I don't even want to be with you. I mean, who, who, <laughs> who doesn't want to? I, I only went because you're a dentist. I, I didn't go because, right. you know, I, I'm trying to... Uh, I mean, there was no other reason I went. I, I wanted to find my colleagues and the people that were, that you met at um, the Pinky Institute. I mean, even yeah. um, the, the people that you talked with, I mean, the Pinky, I look back at the six, the weeks I spent at the Pinky is, yeah, you got a third of the learning during the day to five during the classes, but you got two thirds hanging out in the dorms at night, talking about everything from A to Z till three o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's some, exactly some, correct. Yeah, sometimes the next day at the pinky during the lecture, you, you slept the first two hours because you were up talking with 10 dentists till 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and uh, and I, find, 
I find that's the same thing. Most of the important work and the most important communication happens after the uh, at, at the lunch hour and after the meeting when you're just hanging out, just talking with everybody. That's when you really gain the most knowledge, and that's what collegial uh, situations are supposed to be. And Sometimes we've lost that kind of collegial atmosphere, and it's a real shame. We were talking about that at a recent meeting that I was at, how we used to get together to share and to help each other out, and today it's worry about whether or not they're stealing your patients. So there's more of a, a worry about business rather than collegial atmosphere, and that's a real shame. And that was one of the biggest singular draws that I had in dentistry because I live next door to my idol and dentist, Kenny Anderson, and I would, um, you know, I'd go to work with my dad and it was at Sonic Drive-In making hamburgers and cheeseburgers. Then I'd go to work with Kenny and that was making root canals and crowns, far more exciting. But the coolest thing is he would always take me to lunch and he would always buy. Mm -hmm. And it was always to yep. the West Side Bowling Alley where ah. um, about eight other dentists met. And I thought it was just so romantic and cool that all the dentists on West Street would meet for lunch at the bowling alley and then, right. and then I came out here to Phoenix, Arizona, and, and you, every dentist you met had never gone to lunch with the same dentist in the same medical dental center. And it's like, it's like at first I thought, was this the difference between small town country Kansas and now I'm living in the big city? But, but, um, and, and I also can tell you this, now that I've been doing this for 20 years, the dentist in my Ahwatukee little zip code that always want to do lunch um, or go to uh, dinner or have happy hour af afterwards, those were the most successful dentists. And right. the ones who viewed you as a competitor and didn't want to know your name or whatever, they have dingling practices and they're miserable and they don't even, and then when you see them, they don't even look happy. And the best thing about the AGD and getting your MAGD is to find the people who just eat, live, breathe, die and shit dentistry and they just love it and, and you're involved. I, I see your poster all over the place. I mean, I can tell you this is, this is a big part of your life, isn't it? It is. It is. Education and trying to share the insanity that I've learned over the course of the years with other people who are crazy enough to want to listen to what I have to say is really a lot of fun. Because uh, as, I, as I tell the people that I have the opportunity to speak with, uh, I learn as much from my audiences as I hope they learn from me. And it's always a pearl or a dozen pearls that I get from every audience that I ever have the opportunity to speak to. And that's really the exciting part. Uh, just getting out and being there. You know, today, our younger docs are not getting the tutorage that you and I had when we were starting out in this business. We didn't, you know, at that point in time, the senior doc would take care of us, bring us under their wing, and essentially help us understand how to do better in dentistry. That's not happening today. We're, we're really falling short of what we really need to do. So, that's where the academy comes into place. That's where Dental Town comes in, into play, where we can all meet and talk and basically vent when necessary. Yeah, and I, I see this podcast is like going to lunch on the west side of dentistry at Rose, uh, at Rose Bowl Bowling Alley, um, you know, just a different format. And, uh, but anyway, so you, uh, when we were talking, you, um, start with the warning signs of imbalance in the oral cavity. Now, that's an interesting thing. I think that we're seeing a lot of issues today with our patient population in which patients are presenting and they've got rampant decay or they've got some kind of oral lesion or they've got some kind of periodontal disease and something is out of whack in the way that I look at things. And I, I believe that we need to look a little further than just telling them to brush and floss more. There's a heck of a lot more going on to that. Uh, people have dry, dry mouth circumstances occurring, people who are not physically taking care of their mouths the way that they need to, drinking more water, hydrating appropriately, uh, medications. Our physicians are throwing folks on meds left, right, and backwards, and it's having all kinds of interesting physiological effects on the oral cavity. So we need to look at things very cl closely. Medical history, in everything that we do with our, our, our patients, that's critical. That's job one. If we're not reviewing the med history really closely to see what meds may be creating a situation in the oral cavity, we're missing a big, big boat there. So that's really important part because a lot of meds are causing dry mouth. And a dry mouth situation is going to create cavities and other issues within the mouth that could be simply adjusted if we just took a look at the med history.
the meds so are completely of out of control. I mean, I read things that uh, there's 7 billion people on earth, 330 million of them live in the United States, and we take 50% of the prescription pills. Isn't and, that crazy? And, and, then, and then when you're old school and someone, you know, I mean, what, some people you say, well, you have high cholesterol, and they say, okay, I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna right. to exercise more. Other people say, I'm just going to take a pill. And then, and then you go in there and you have high blood pressure. Some people say, well, if I have high blood pressure, I should probably move more, sweat more, eat less salt, uh, eat more uh, fruits and vegetables. And then the other deal is just I want to take a pill because I, I, I'm, I don't want to say not take your pills, but I do want to say this insight um, of having all these patients for 20 years. It seems like the men in their 60s who are already on a half dozen prescription pills, they're all dead by 65 or 70. And, it, and every time I walk in the room and it's an 85-year-old man who just got off the tennis court or the golf course, he's not on any prescriptions. Have you seen mm -hmm. that? Have you noticed that trend? Yeah. There's a certain, you know, we, we, obesity is a really major challenge in the country right now. And basically, we've got an extreme situation going on. We've got those people who are obese and we've got those people who are extraordinarily physically fit. But interestingly enough, uh, a report that came out of the London Olympics a couple of years ago showed that a lot of these folks that were really physically fit and working on getting medals and everything failed because they had disease in the oral cavity. Cavities, periodontal disease, abscesses, et cetera, and so forth. So we've got to be on the lookout for not only the people that are overweight, but we've got to look at these people who are really uh, incredible athletes and working on their physical physique, but they may not be taking care of their oral cavity as well. And that was a really interesting study in the British uh, Journal of uh, Sports Medicine that came out about two years ago. Really fascinating. And that, that, that started me thinking. Also, I'm sure that you've had it over the course of time. A lot of your patients would come in and they say, my teeth have always been soft. Teeth aren't soft. Teeth become soft because of the acidic effect that goes on in the oral cavity. So we need to look at the possibility of an acidic mouth going on. One of the key questions that my good friend Brian Novi told me years ago, he said, John, if you want to know if your patient has an acidic mouth, just ask them if they like the taste of water. If they don't like the taste of water, they have an acidic mouth. That's an incredible clue that he gave to me. And I use that all the time when we're looking and we're talking and we're, we're, we're analyzing what our patient's problems are. And if they do have a situation in which they don't like the taste of water, we need to find a way for them to change this acidic mouth. We drink a lot of Coca-Cola in this country and other carbonated beverages because it, the sweet of these carbonated beverages makes the acidity dissipate, at least temporarily. It overwhelms that acidic feeling. So we need to find ways of, of changing that and challenging that. One of the ways that we recommend on a regular basis is the use of xylitol products, gums, mints, sugars. Putting a four gram pack of, of xylitol into a 16 ounce bottle of water twice a day, that gives you eight grams of xylitol throughout the course of the day. That's going to help to relieve acidic mouth. It's going to affect the strep mutans in the mouth and the other bacteria. So this way they can't attach onto the dental structure. That's going to help. Baking soda, using baking soda to the brush or to rinse with a couple of times a day, that's going to help with neutralization of the mouth. These are all really easy, inexpensive ways that we can help our patients. But the first question is, you got to find out, do they have an acidic mouth? And how would you, and how would you find out if they have an acidic mouth? Just simply ask that, them the water? That simple question, do they like the taste of water? If they don't like it, I'll give you dollars for donuts that they don't like. They don't like water because it tastes bad because of the acidic mouth. Have them changing that oral environment is going to help it. And you're also going to help to arrest the activity of the decay and other issues that are going on. So that's one of the ways to stop the my teeth have always been soft conversation. So how MMPs are involved in the destructive process? Explain that. That's a, well, that's another interesting one. Matrix metalloproteinases are some of the endogenous uh, proteases that are found in the tooth structure, especially in the dentin. They're also found in saliva. And basically, our overall approach to bonding our dental restorative materials in place. Uh, over the last few years, some of the literature is coming out with uh, changing maybe the way that we need to look at things. Because when we're creating a hybrid layer, and I know folks like John Kanker is probably going to attack me the next time I see him. But the reality here is, is that 
we, we've got a real challenge with MMPs because the hybrid layer, the, the odontoblast and the dentin of the tooth structure are, as you and I know, are living, breathing cells and they're, they're affected by everything that goes on. So when we create a hybrid layer, we're actually enabling the odontoblast to set up a, a, an inflammatory response, a response to that uh, hybrid layer attack. And in that, they're es essentially secreting these MMPs and other proteases that are starting to destroy the hybrid layer. When you and I placed amalgams years ago, and you went to go take them out, sometimes you found that that amalgam never came out. You had almost like use a bulldozer to get it out of there or some dynamite. Nowadays, when the composite fails, that thing goes flying out of the mouth. That's the MMPs. That's the endogenous enzymes that are destroying our hybrid layer. We need to look at this very differently. In the uh, February issue of the Journal of Dental Research, there was an article called The Role of Dental MMPs in Caries Progression and Bond Stability by M Mazzoni, uh, Tay, and Pashley. And it was a really interesting one because it was a 10-year retrospective that talks about this process of bond failure over the course of time. And it's another issue that I really think that we need to look at. We're, we're failing because even in our best uh, 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 two-step bonding processes, the overall effect is occurring and this, this breakdown of the acidity from uh, the mouth and from the overall proteins of the, these enzymes in the tooth structure are just destroying everything. So it's a really interesting article. I talk a lot about this on the road. I write a lot about this as well, and uh, it's just making me think that maybe we need to reapproach things. We need to work with things that are more bioactive that can help create appetite in the tooth structure rather than a hybrid layer. And there are certain materials and products out there that help us with that. You know, things like Theracal LC, that'll help to form a, an appetite formation over the course of time. Activa Bioactive Restorative Base and Liner Material will do that. Cermer, as one of the cements that I use for almost all of my crown and bridge nowadays, will help to create appetite formation. Biodentin which is another product that's used for dentin replacement. That's a great way to replace dentin and to stop the MMPs and to create appetite. What we need to do is not create a hybrid layer. We need to create an appetite layer so that this way hydroxyapatite and the overall tooth structure can become more in, uh, together and synonymous with one another again. And I think that over the next couple of years, as you and I start to work with newer materials like that, we're going to see appetite becoming a more important aspect than bond strengths. So anyway, we can get a, an online course about all this out of you? Sure, I think we could probably arrange for that. I know that, I know that the other Howard has been trying to twist my arm into it for a while, and I'm sure that we'll get that done. <laughs> uh, I, that, that would seem amazing. Now, now for our listeners, um, you, you're a big poster on Dental Town. Is there, um, could, could you start a thread that, that, that um, started this uh, MMPs or... Uh... Or I'd, I'd be happy to. The, I, I've tried that in the past, Howard, and what happens is the, there are some zealots out there, um, and, and you get attacked. And my hope is that they will be kind <laughs> this time uh, that I try this out, uh, because I know that I've, I've made statements on this, and, and John, of course, has been one of the guys that, that he and I have conversations. He's a good friend. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't under, he doesn't believe in MMPs. He doesn't believe in these uh, endogenous proteases that are there, but I think as, as the years have gone by and more of the literature starts to show that it is present and it is an activity that's going on, my hope is that we can find great workarounds because we've got so many great composite materials out there. We've got all these great tooth-colored things, but if we're failing because of our bond, then we're failing our patients, and certainly I'd be very happy to do something in there. So, well, well uh, for our viewers, what, uh, well, for, well, first of all, I, I, I'm, I still apologize. Oh, I've been apologizing for five years <laughs> that, um, you know, when I started Dental Town in 98, you know, I'm still a registered libertarian. I mean, I, I don't understand people who are <laughs> proud of being a Republican or Democrat. I mean, one robbed the bank, one drove the getaway car. How, how could you love either of those parties? And, and, but the deal is, I just thought that, you know, that everybody's a doctor. You got only got eight to 12 years of college. I'm not going to be the truth police. I'm not going to be a moderator. But what I did not understand was cyberbullying. And that's why we yeah. brought on Howard Goldstein uh, years yeah. ago and, uh, and put a report abuse button on because, um, because you and I both know that we all know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. 
And exactly. seriously, a thousand years from now, we're going to look like a bunch of cavemen right now. The smartest guy, the smartest dentist in the world is going to look like the Flintstones and Barney Rubble in <laughs> 3015. So we all know that none, none of us know. Uh, none of us know. So we're all in this together. So, but, um, but what would be the Tony, name of the- Tony's, Howard, townies are the greatest people in the entire world because every time that I've gone on and been able to read and share some posts with them, it's been an absolutely fabulous thing. So the majority of, of, of the townies out there are absolutely incredible. There are periodically a few folks that are just unfortunate, but thank God, you know, they're not as bad as they used to be. Yeah, and, and like I say, if, if anybody ever posts something that makes you feel bad, you hit that report abuse button because uh, a, lot of, a lot of dentists, they say things, well, I have freedom of speech. Moron, that's the Constitution. That's between you and your government. Dental Town right. is private property. I own it 100%, and it's like having a party at my house. And if we're having a party at my house, you be nice to the guests, and we can discuss <laughs> all these things in a fun way. But if you want to exactly. have too many drinks and start calling names, then we're going to ask you to leave. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, but I, I want to back up even further, 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 um, sure. all the way back to the amalgam composite. I mean, um, you, you were talking about all these, uh, composites and bonding layers and hybrid layers. Um, I'm amazed at how many dentists will look you square in the eyes and say, well, composites last longer than amalgams because it bonds the walls together. You moron. And I'm like, do you believe in gravity or research? So I'm going to ask you this question. What lasts longer, amalgam or composite? The reality and the science continues to show us amalgam lasts uh, almost four times longer than the average composite. The average composite, according to studies, is living about 5.7 years. And how and long amalgam is, is lasting? Amalgam is lasting between 15 and 20 and so, and so why do these dentists, I mean, I, I mean, I get in this argument all the time. It's like, is it be like a dentist and it'll be his own son and he'll be like six years old with a burger hanging out of his nose <laughs> and he needs an occlusal on number three and they put right. in composite. I'm like, dude, what are you thinking? One, one, this won't even get him out of high school. It won't even get him out of college. And then these dentists are proud when they say they're amalgam free. It's like, right. at what point have you left science and you're no longer a doctor? I mean, if you're telling me that in your practice of 2,000 patients, you, you never had one indication for an amalgam in 2014, at this point, you're not even a doctor. Would you agree Correct. with that? I agree 100%. The reality is, is that amalgam, unfortunately, got a really bad rap. And we, we took it away from ourselves a lot faster than we really should have, all because of 60 Minutes and Morally Safer and all the other stuff and the, the mercury release of gases, which basically we found out over the course of time was a lot of hooey. Uh, there really wasn't. The, the overall measuring, measuring uh, capability that they used was wrong. So amalgam is a good material, and it has its place. Uh, I, I like the opportunity to use as many types of materials and have as much in my arm as I can. A lot of the materials nowadays and some interesting stuff that's coming out there, uh, like Pulp Dance Activa, bioactive restorative material, that's got some really interesting properties that can be used in a lot of places in the mouth uh, because it doesn't require a bonding agent, even though if you use a bonding agent initially, it's okay because what happens with Activa, one of the interesting parts is that after a period of time, as the bonding agent becomes, it becomes dissolved by the attack of the MMPs, it's actually able to penetrate through the bonding agent and start to create an appetite layer and actually form a union with the tooth structure. So I think that Pulp Dent with this product and some of the other things that they've got in their pipeline is going to change how we look at restorative procedures as we go forward. And it's really exciting to, to work with and, 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 and play with it, this kind of stuff and to be on the cutting edge with what Pulp Dent and a lot of other companies are starting to come out with. So it's really very, very key. Uh, I've been very blessed to be associated with the folks over there uh, and, and being able to help work with things. It's the same thing like with Shofu's uh, Beauty Fill products. Those things with the SPRG fillers that release fluoride and other ions into the mouth that neutralize the oral cavity. These are things that are really very exciting because it helps to reduce plaque formation. It helps to uh, improve the overall uh, ability of that area to stay uh, caries free. It's got the 13 year studies that shows that that restorative material actually lasts well for 13 years because of the ion released from the surface partially reactive glass in it. So there's a lot of really cool stuff. So is that considered a glass ionomer? No, it's actually, it's a, 
uh, I like to call it a, a reservoir restored of material because it has a partially reacted glass ion fiber that's embedded in this resin matrix. Uh, that's, the, that's the beautiful product. Uh, and the, the, the pulp activa product is a kind of resin modified glass ionomer, but it's not, a real, it's not really because it has other components to it. So these are two of my major restorative materials that I use in the office today. Uh, they, they, are, they are very, very incredibly useful. And they're certainly something that I talk about all the time and I write about all the time, these kinds of materials that are very, very effective, uh, that are resilient, that are highly polishable, that are lasting uh, without failure. So these are the kinds of things that I really think that we need to be looking closer at. I, I know that a lot of folks like a lot of the other uh, composite materials out there, and they're all great because they have excellent physical properties. But again, they don't bring anything to the game. There's nothing bioactive. There's nothing uh, that releases ions that are going to help to neutralize the oral cavity to help with the acidic effect that's going on. That's going to help to help with remineralization of the enamel surface and, and form a bond like glass ionomers can and do in their product capability. So there's so many different things that we've kind of overlooked because in my opinion, the U.S. is a little bit more uh, uh, composite-centric rather than bioactive-centric. And hopefully over the course of time, more and more people will look at it in that capacity. So You're we, saying composite-centric really instead of bioactive-centric. And, and I, 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 yeah. I've been calling it something else. Uh, your other bald brother, me, uh, with AMAGD, <laughs> calls it that two dentists are like engineers. And they're always yeah. talking about building bridges and houses and crowns. It's like, dude... Everything fails from biology invasion by bacteria, and now we're finding out that uh, fungi, because Canada albicans is uh, uh, interacting with the streptococcus mutans, so it's going to fail from bacteria and fungi, and you need to be a biologist. I mean, at the end of the day, right. we're, we're civil engineers building uh, buildings, but everything's failing. These, these barns we're building are failing from termites, and at the end of the day, all of our failures come from biology. And we went from an amalgam where it was half mercury. That's not very mm -hmm. uh, bacterial uh, friendly. Um, the other half, silver, zinc, copper, and tin. Those, everything. Right. I mean, all that's in. And then we went to this inert composite with nothing, right. nothing bioactive. And, and, exactly. and, and then you go to other parts of the world like Japan, and they're like, shouldn't there be active ingredients all of a sudden? They're, they're huge into glass on them. So I want to ask you exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, so yep. why, why are the Japanese who give us Lexus and Infiniti and, and, and cars that last three times longer than Chevys and Fords, uh, why are they all using bioactive uh, glass onomers and we're using inert plastic? It's, it's a lot of places. It's Australia, New Zealand also are in that category because that's where a lot of the materials come from, from both Japan and Australia. You've got Japan with, with GC and you've got uh, Australia with uh, SDI. These companies have been producing great glass ionomers and resin modified glass ionomers for years. Uh, Equia from GC is an incredible product. It is a, it's, it's a bulk fill restorative material that basically has the ability to wear because of the coating that you put on top of it. That coating protects that glass ionomer underneath it and it enables it to, to basically work harden over the course of time. So why does Japan do it? Because they, they look at things a lot differently. They're, they, we've, been, we've been basically told that bonding is the way that it is and that's the only way that it is. The reality is there are so many different games out there. And you're right. Most of us in our undergraduate degree probably have a bachelor's in biology in some capacity. We've forgotten that we are supposed to be scientists and look for the truth. Look at the oral condition as you've just indicated there. Why do we not look at that? Well, because we'd rather take things and do it cookbook rather than using our mind and trying to analyze a circumstance. It's not everybody, but I do run into that a lot. And it's unfortunate because my, I drive my assistants crazy because they don't know what material I'm going to ask for when we do a procedure because they know that every procedure that I do, depending on what we're doing, is going to call for certain materials at certain times. And at, at some times I need X and other times I need Y. And they know that on a moment's notice, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to call an audible change the overall formation on the huddle, and we're going to go out and, and score that touchdown in a different way than we were originally thinking. So 
Um, so you opened up this can of worms, buddy. So now you're going to have to, you're going to have to close that can of worms. So, okay. So first Not things problem. first, um, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful woman and it's anterior teeth. Uh, she's not, nice. she, uh, so, you know, she, she doesn't care about fluoride releasing. She wants beauty. What material would right. you use canine to canine on a beautiful woman? Well, if I'm doing something like that, if I'm, if I'm going to be doing something like that, I'm probably going to be doing some kind of veneers unless they're just small restorative materials. Yeah, and then if it's small, if, if it's a, it's direct. a, if it's a big a direct. cosmetic case. No, 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 not, direct, a, big, not, a, not a big cosmetic case, but a, um, we're talking direct. Okay, then I'm probably going to use something. It, uh, initially, I'm going to probably use stuff like uh, the Beautyfill products. I like the Flow Plus, the Beautyfill Flow Plus products Who because makes I can get in there. That's Shofu. Okay, Shofu, uh, that's out Shofu of Japan. products. Really Beautyful. nice. Yep, exactly. Is that a yep. microfill? And basically, it is a nano hybrid uh, material. Uh, really beautiful. It, it polishes up really nicely. If I'm doing a direct veneer, I'm probably going to use something like U veneer uh, to basically create my overall shape and outline. It's it's by the company called U veneer. U V E N N E R. Uh, really easy, quick kit to work with. They, I do a lot of direct composites uh, veneers with that. It's just Where's really veneer easy. out of? They're out of Australia. Australia. Uh, yeah. When and I think I of Australia, a, I was thinking of Jeffrey Knight. Jeff Knight is a good friend. Uh, Jeff is a wonderful one. He, he's basically one of my mentors. Yeah, and, same uh, here. He, he, has, he has such incredible – he's the guy that got me excited about glass ionomer many, many years ago. And he and, and no. Uh, he's, he and no. Yes. Yeah, out of Adelaide. Yep, yep, exactly, yep. They're, these these folks down, out, down under really – are brilliant. They have a lot of great things. Uh, uh, Graham Ilicic, I guess, is the other guy that Out talks a lot Zealand. about. Uh, yep, he talks a lot about GI as well. And again, these are people that I've read and, and talked about and, and really admire because they open up a new avenue and things. But when you get to cosmetics, you need something that's going to be highly polishable. But if you can use a material like a Beauty Fill uh, product, a Beauty Fill 2 or a Beauty Fill Flow Plus materials, uh, y you're going to have a really great aesthetic. Uh, you're going to have a great strength, but you have to bond them in properly. And so you got to realize that if you're going to use a seventh generation and you're on enamel and you don't etch, you're going to fail. Our strongest bond is to enamel. So try to bevel as much as you can and create a nice aesthetic in that capacity too. Okay, so and what if it's a, a direct um, composite on a, um, on a molar and it's mm -hmm. on, a, uh, it's on a, a teenage kid that drinks Pepsi and has a high decay rate? Activa, Activa by, bio, Bioactive Restorative, I would go in there. Activa, by, Activa by Bioactive Restorative, where, where are they it's, at? It's, it's, it's the Pulp Dent product, it's called Activa Bioactive. Anywhere posterior, I'm placing Activa because of its bioactive capability, its ability to create an appetite layer once the bond is dissipated. Uh, really very, very exciting material. It's been on the market now for a couple of years. I've been working with it in trials in my office for about three years now, and we're seeing an incredible polishability, incredible wear resistance. So that's by Pulp Dent, and it's A-C-T-I-V-A, Activa, bioactive. It comes in both a restorative material and in a base liner material. Where's and Pulp Dent really out of? Out of Watertown, Massachusetts. Watertown? Is that a suburb of Boston? Just outside of Boston. Just yep. outside of Boston. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. They're okay. Remar they're That's remarkable. You know that they've been avail They've been around for a long time, and people don't realize what they do. Uh, you guys ought to check into Pulp Dent. They've really got some remarkable stuff. Is the founding father <laughs> still running it? No, Mister Hal, Hal Burke is is no longer with us, but his three sons are in charge there, and they, with Larry Clark, run the business, and they run it incredibly well. Uh, so the the Burke brothers are are, are great folks. They're they're, was the they're kind of like the founding father a dentist. Family. Yes, he was an endodontist at Tufts University. Real? Any of his three kids a dentist? No, none of the three went into the profession, but they went into the man, they continued the manufacturing business, and they are innovators in everything that they do. They're incredible scientists. They're incredible folks. Uh, they're just wonderful. And if you if any of the folks ever get out to Watertown. Just, just, just call them and let them know that you want a tour of their plant and you want to speak with them about things. They're, they're very hospitable and they're very warm and open, open and loving people. Who, who's their uh, dentist uh, um, product champion or who's? 
I, I guess I'm one of them. You're uh, one of them? You know, I, I guess I'm one of them. Yeah, I, I've been working with them for a number of years now on different things. Uh, they're, they're terrific. Uh, you can talk to folks like Rob Lowe uh, about it. Bob and I have worked with, with Pulp Dem for a long time now. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other folks that are out there, but you know, definitely I think Bob can give you a good lowdown on things as well. Okay, another, another thing um, you, you, uh, you uh, answered a can of worms. I'm going to finish. Um, you just said um, seven generation bonding agents. So, uh, my God, how many generations are there? And is it all noise? Or, I mean, what, what are we on now? Is it seven, eight? It's at, it's at least seven. It, it's at least seven. Some companies are claiming possibly eighth. But the reality here is as we're becoming trying to make it simpler and simpler, the, the chemistry has to become more and more exquisite. And whether or not it's really bonding, and the initial bond strengths are always great no matter what bonding agent you use. It's the long term three months, six months, two years, et cetera, and so forth, where you start to see the problems. And we can use all kinds of things to try to reduce MMPs like uh, chlorhexidine and uh, gluconate to try to do things. But the reality is in the long-term studies, chlorhexidine and gluconate has only been studied at most up to three years. And after three years, it fails to stop the MMP activity because there's still that activity, that's still that enzymatic uh, resultant going on in the tooth structure. Because the odontoblasts are still responding. They're still reacting to the hybrid layer. It's, it's just a weird phenomenon. So do these things work? If they don't have an MMP inhibitor in them, uh, there's only a few out there that have any kind of MMP inhibitors in their chemistry. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, there's not more at this point in time. Uh, Shofu's Beauty Bond is one of the few that I'm aware of that has an MMP inhibitor in it. It's carboxylic acid. Is inhibits the MMP formation at least initially, and so that's a good thing. But I don't know what long term it does. I have to continue working on that and finding the research that they're being doing on that. Uh, but that's it. The problem is, no matter what generation, you still have those enzymes that are going to start to attack, and they're suddenly going to release and are going to break down that bond over the course of time. So. Bond strength is bond strength initially. I can, you can tell me you've got 100 uh, megapascals of bond strength initially, but what is it going to be like in a year? And that's where the study, that's where the rubber really hits the road. What is it like in a year? So an another thing you and I have seen in, in our lifetime, I mean, when we got out of Cosmetic Crown was a PFM. And you and right. I have literally lived through almost the disappearance of the PFM. Um, talk about that. Are you still doing PFMs? Um, have they disappeared in no. your practice? They have. I've been going with a lot of zirconia and Emacs nowadays uh, since I switched to scanners uh, for, my, for my work. I'm using a, a three-shaped trios in the office now and working with my labs. Uh, I'm loving being able to do digital scans. So zirconia and Emacs and now the anterior uh, aesthetic zirconias that are starting to come out, they're looking really exciting. As so far you're, you're as optically that. scanning instead of taking an impression? Correct. So, yeah. Okay. So, so, um, how long you been doing that? Almost two years now. Two years. And what scanner was, did you go with? Went the the Trios three shape. And and the who makes that? One. That's by three shape. They're they're it, a, a European country, but they're taking basically. If you think about it, every lab has three shape in the lab, so it made sense to me. Why not have a three shape on my side of it? Their imaging will go together better, and that's how they process everything on a three-shape uh, lab-generated uh, 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 product in the, uh, in, in the lab area. So they've got the software, they've got the hardware. Why not give them something directly from, from that aspect? And I was at IDS a couple of months ago in Germany, uh, and the new stuff that's coming out from 3Shape that will start hitting the market within the next couple of months are just going to be remarkable. What Upgrading country are they from? Uh, God. I can't remember. I think it's uh, Scandinavia. I can't remember. I apologize. My brain so, is so frozen. What, um, so what impression material did you used to use? Oh, I love working with Kettenbach's uh, Panacil, and I love DMG's Honey Gum. Those are two of my favorite impression materials when I was using impression materials. They're still some are of the Are those polyethers or polyvinyls? Yeah, uh, polyvinyl sloxins. Yeah. Polyvinyl sloxins? Yeah, I love them. Yeah. I was yeah. always a polyether guy myself. I was always an emperor gum man. 
But, um, I, but so Emperor Gum just basically smelled so bad, and the patients hated the taste of it. So it was always hard to reintroduce that, even though see, it got easier with the auto mixing. Since <laughs> I don't, since I don't bathe or shower, or use deodorant, I could just blame it on that, and they'd say, "What does that smell?" And I'd say, "It's not me. It's the Emperor Gum." But no, um, but so so, how much did you pay for the three shape? About, uh, about what see. what kind of investment were you looking at? It was. It was between 30 and 40, if I recall correctly. It's probably around 35K at the time. And is there any variable cost with each impression, or you just buy it and now your scans are... There's, it's an, there's an annual licensing fee, and basically that also incorporates the, uh, the upgrades in software, et cetera, that goes on. So it's cost comparisonly uh, for me at the time, and that was two years ago, that was the best machine on the market, in my opinion. Uh, for someone who wasn't going to mill in office. Guys, of course, are big on CIRAC. It's an incredible uh, mechanism, incredible machine. What I didn't like about CIRAC, unfortunately, is the closed architecture. Uh, most of the, mostly everybody else has gone to open architecture. Uh, I think that CIRAC is moving uh, along into a, an, another aspect, but I'm not as familiar with it today as, as I was when I was doing my research to buy. At and that time and also, it also depends on how many ops you have. I mean, there's a lot of dentists that only have three or four ops, they don't have room for another fifth off. And, and it, you know, to, to see the patient, numb them up, prep it, impress, let them out, you flip that chair in an hour, and then you buy right. uh, CAD cam, and now that chair's been occupied for two to three hours. So a lot, a lot yeah. of times it just doesn't make any sense. So if, if, if you're right. chair long and you delegate to your assistant, you can, you can go to another room, the assistant can stay in there sure. and do everything. It's fantastic. But, if, if, sure. uh, but sometimes operational logistics is just not going to work. You have to really look at your business model and how you operate, and you're exactly right, because if you don't have that additional room, and if you don't have an assistant that can really be trained well to do the crowns for you, it's, it really doesn't make sense to do it in-house. There are some guys, and a lot of my friends, like Sam Halbo out there in California, Sam does all the Cirax in office, but he's got an incredibly well-trained staff that does his work for. Jack Griff does that as well. Uh, these, these guys are great buddies, and they've talked to me about this, but the reality in my office and in my work is that it made sense to send everything to lab rather than playing in the office with it. Yeah, and it's totally different for me because I'm spoiled rotten. I mean, I'm in Phoenix, and my good buddy Samir at the Scottsdale Center is literally right up the exactly. street, and he comes down he to can my do everything. office, <laughs> or, I, or I send my, my staff up to him. So uh, you're right. So on the Zirconi, what brand name are you using? I mean, are you doing Bruxer uh, with Glidewell? Bruxer, or Bruxer is, is, is one of the main brands that are out there. Uh, it's a beautiful, yeah. A well, lot of the labs well, what, have licensed the Bruxer. Uh, what are, what so brand are you using for Zirconium? The Bruxer. Yeah. You're using the Bruxer? The Bruxer is the and, yeah, and, what, and exactly. what are you cementing that with? I'm using, I'm using the Cerimer uh, by Doxa. It's C-E-R-M-I-R -R, uh, by Doxa, D-O-X-A. They are from, uh, from uh, Scandinavia. It's an incredible bioactive. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nano uh, hybrid, nano activated uh, uh, cement that basically forms appetite onto the tooth structure, will bond to the zirconia without doing anything to the zirconia. Uh, and so you don't have to do any special prep. You don't have to silent it. You, uh, you don't have to use any uh, primer on it or anything. You can just take it from the mouth, wash it off, put the, uh, the serumer in there, and put it on the moist tooth. It likes moisture. It sets up. So it's a nanostructurally bio-integrating bio bio ceramic, and it's really very exciting. So that's a really nice thing. The problem is you've got to triturate it. You've got to mix it in an amalgamator. You can't just mix it by hand. That's the downside of it for those folks out there that don't have triturators. But since I use a lot of glass ionomer, we have triturators in every, tri in, in every treatment room. So it oh, wasn't a big deal to switch but what that. Would you, but what would, you, um, what would you say, though, to a dentist that doesn't have a triturator? I mean, I mean, well, did you, you, I mean what, do you ever use amalgam? No. I haven't used amalgam in a while. But yeah. uh, but I have the triturators because you need to triturate the the glass ionomer right. the capsule form they have. So basically, I think so, that the investment in a, in a good triturator, the four hundred bucks or so for a triturator, to use a cement like Cermer or to use, be able to use a resin modified glass ionomer or a glass ionomer for restorative capabilities. It's a good investment, short and long term, in my opinion. But, but come on, man, I don't I don't want to be the only uh, jerk on this podcast. I, w I want you to. I want you to throw this guy driving his car under a bus. What do you say to a doctor, a dentist, 
that doesn't have a church radar. I mean, are you telling me? So, I mean, so let me say this. So, so you got a yeah. uh, seventy-five-year-old man with Alzheimer's yeah. who doesn't yeah. even know what country he lives in, and he's got right. root surface decay on the buckle of two, and it's and right. he's got and he's poor hygiene, and you can't keep it dry, and it's a disaster. Really, dude, you're gonna bond in an inert composite? You can't. It's impossible. So then, what would you no say? So then, what would you say to a dentist so, who did so not a you, you would well, basically, then you're going to have to use something like Activa in there because basically that can be used in a slightly damp environment. You don't want it soaking wet. It's going to adhere to the tooth surface. Uh, you can do that. But basically, in my opinion, if I can get a good GI into that, I'm a happy guy too. So again, that's why I said, Howard, I've got more crap that I can pull from because I, I have a very open mind as to what I want to use. So there's no way that I'm going to get stopped because I've, if, of, of a circumstance. If this isn't going to work, and I, there have been times when one material just doesn't work, I say, all right, let's go to the next one, and they drag that out for me. You can't have just you can't be just a one shot Charlie. Otherwise, you're just stuck. Right, and, but, and that same, be, but that same but that same dentist that who says he's a doctor, and now he's got a 74 yeah. year old man with Alzheimer's with almost right. zero home care in a nursing home, and it's the same dentist who's whining about high overhead and how the insurance companies are cutting his fee. And I'm telling him, dude, a barrel of bonding agent is about a million and a half dollars, where a barrel <laughs> of oil. Is fifty right. to a hundred dollars, and I can right. fix that with amalgam in literally Easily. three minutes. Right. And then, and then he says, in then order he says, to do that, but he needs a triturator in order to do right, that. Right, right. So, so, so he just, still still needs a piece of equipment. That's so, the problem here is that we've gotten away from the, an important piece of equipment. You're exactly right. And, and the only secret to lower prices is lower cost. They always complain about overhead. Then when you ever put a decision for him and say, okay, okay, you use three different kinds of gloves. Can we pick one glove? No. Okay, you, you, you won't ever use an amalgam when indicated. Can we just use amalgam sometimes? No. And, and you, you lay down 20 decisions. He says no to every single decision, and then he says, but what about my overhead? It's like, well, dude, if you're going to change something big, you got to change something small. You know what I mean? And if right. you can't change anything small, you're never going to change anything big. And I agree. There, there are some folks out there that unfortunately are always going to be, as my father used to say, cabalosta thick-headed, and won't understand simplicity when they have that opportunity. My hope is that as time goes by and they continue to bang their head against the wall, that they start to listen to these simple ideas that folks like you and I are trying to provide to them. And, and you also have the same type of street smart I see in the MAGDs to where if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the best thing about the AGD is they made us take classes and things we didn't want to take classes in. Like, exactly. And so, like, you're telling me you don't want to do ortho. Are you telling me there's never an indication to just unravel some teeth before you do veneers? You Isn't know, that are, the are, coolest thing when you can do that, too? You know, suddenly you start to see things lining up, and then you get the veneers on there. That patient has the happiest smile on their face when they're done because you did something – that no one else suggested. And what you're hearing, uh, I'm 52. How old are you, dude? I'm 58. Okay, and what, what you're hearing from two old guys that have been doing this 30 years is the fact that the most tools you can have in your toolbox, the most products, the most, if, you, if you're just going to say, I'm never going to do an ortho case, you don't even know what you don't know. Carl Misch told me something most interesting. He said that the reason he made it to the top in implants is because he mastered removable first. He cut his teeth in making full yeah. mouth dentures. And then when all these other dentists were complaining that these implants weren't strong enough, they're all snapped to the gun line. He says, yeah, because your denture occlusion is so bad. Uh, the bite yeah. is off so pathetic. And, and a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go to Panky because I don't have that kind of practice. Dude, you go to Pinky because you're still going to have that case that you're going to need all those deals. Um, there, there's a time when you're going to need to mount something in an articulator. There's a time when you're going to need to do and learning all that stuff. If you just if you just come out thick head and say, well, I'm never going to pull teeth and I'm not going to go to Pinky and I'm not going to do ortho. And, and you just you set up all these parameters. You just really right. limit your thinking. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're, so I'm always, you're exactly correct. I'm always on the watch out for extremism. I mean, I, I just still think that there's one indication for an amalgam every year and having that roadblock um, just starts a, a whole series of roadblocks. And, 
chain yeah. reaction and all that stuff. So I, I'm down to, I only got you for 10 more minutes. Um, I, I want to, I want to ask you this. Um, oh, well, first of all, I got, I got to go back to your, uh, um, oral cancer. You're, you're, uh, you're involved with vigilant biosciences and, 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 and I want to, I want to do a little rant on oral cancer. I always thought in America, which is a 88% Christian that, that, um, oral cancer really not never got the care because it's very judgmental. It was always like, well, you right. were bad. You, you smoked and drank. And I remember hearing this with a kid, all the, you know, everyone who died of uh, alcohol, cirrhosis of the liver. Well, why do you get cirrhosis of the liver? Well, he was a drinker. And it's like, well, a lot of drinkers don't die of cirrhosis of the liver. And then later in my lifetime, they found out there was hepatitis A, B, C, D, and there's a viral component. And I always thought that, I mean, I mean, think about that. The largest dental insurance companies in America don't pay for an oral cancer exam. Is that true? And it's, and it's, it's like, an unfortunate fact. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. downstairs, medical insurance pays for a pap smear and all this stuff like that. And I always thought, you know what? The reason oral, someone dies every hour from oral cancer. And the reason no one pays attention to it and insurance companies don't pay and, and all that is because it was judgmental. Well, you shouldn't have smoked. You shouldn't have, you were a drinking, smoking, drunk Irishman. You got what you deserved. And, and, and now we're finding out that oral and pharyngeal cancer, that there's a viral component to it, HPV, and yet dentists who call themselves a doctor don't talk about it. They don't even have the legal right from their own dental board to give an HPV vaccine. Um, so um, so talk, about, talk about your role in uh, Vigilant Biosciences and, and how that's changed in the last 30 years. Well, it's, it's an amazing thing. I just finished writing a, an editorial for Dental Product Shopper that will appear next month. Uh, in the in the June issue uh, regarding oral cancer, in fact, uh, you know, we just finished in April Oral Cancer Awareness Month. Um, it's kind of funny to me, and the whole topic of the of the article of the editorial was that why are we only talking about this in April? This is a year long problem. This is a thing that needs to be looked at all year long. Oral cancer is there. We need to be evaluating. We need to be screening. We need to be checking. The gold standard still today is the bimanual palpation of the head and neck area, oral, oral soft tissue, uh, making sure that you get in there uh, in some fashion to look what's going on there. But a lot of us don't take the time to really look well. Uh, the American Academy of Prosthetic Dentists have created a YouTube uh, video on how to do a good oral cancer examination. And I encourage everybody who's got new staff members or just a refresher to go to that uh, video and watch it. It's about you know, 17 minutes long, but it's the best thing in the entire world. Do you know how to upload a, a video, a YouTube video on Dentaltown on a message board? Sure. How you? Sure. How yeah. you? Um, can can you start a thread for our listeners? So you betcha. What, what, what are you, what you going to call that thread? I'll call that uh, the best video on how to do an oral cancer exam. All right, great. I'll, I'll do it in that way okay. uh, because it really is a remarkable video. It it shows you step by step, and it's really a great educational aspect. Uh, but oral cancer screening is, is a really important thing. And, and several years ago, um, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. I had testicular cancer uh, 24 years ago. And uh, I figured that I'm here for a reason. I'm here to help uh, to bring a message or a couple of messages to folks around the world. And when I was approached a couple of years ago by Matthew Kim, the CEO of Vigilant Biosciences, to come on board as a consultant and be their dental, dental uh, chief, chief dental officer to help give them a perspective from the dentistry aspect, um, I was very honored. And, and the company is working with uh, creating a uh, salivary diagnostic test that's different than anything else that's currently available uh, because you don't have to wait to see a lesion. Uh, you can do this pro proactively for everybody uh, if everything goes through with 510K and, and, and the uh, FDA the way we want it to. Uh, my hope is that this will be available sometime next year. Uh, year it's a very simple test, and I did some videos uh, at IDS uh, at it with a couple of uh, uh, other, other groups, uh, industry uh, uh, news organizations that came by. But basically, it's a real simple test. So within 10 minutes from the beginning of a, your, it's not going to disrupt the, the workflow in the practice. Uh, you're going to be able to take a salivary sample basically using a saline rinse and uh, five seconds rinsing, five seconds gargling, spitting it into a cup, placing the test mechanism into it, which is basically a couple of protein strips in a special cassette, leaving it for 10 minutes. And at the end of 10 minutes, 
if there's no markers activated, that means your patient doesn't have the CD44 and the total protein concentrations associated with oral squamous cell carcinoma. If you have both markers indicated, your risk of uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma is 25 times that of the average person. Uh, so there's something going on in there. And as you just indicated regarding uh, HPV, the face of oral cancer is changing. It's no longer the tobacco uh, and alcohol uh, user any longer. It could be your teenage son or daughter. It could be your uh, friend next door. It could be almost anybody who doesn't present with the typical risk factors that you and I would, had traditionally uh, been looking for. It could happen to anybody at any time, uh, especially uh, because HPV hides back in the tonsillar area and down the, the, the pharynx region. So we've got to look at these glandular areas, and you can't view them. You can't look at them as well. But having a salivary diagnostic that basically can uh, evaluate the entire oral pharyngeal cavity with one simple test starts to open up our eyes as to possibly the earliest indications, diagnosis, and treatment modalities available than we've ever been able to do before. And that's what vigilance on the forefront of. And it's taking more and more of my private practice time and my other, otherwise time uh, working with them. It's been really exciting uh, to, to start to see them ramp up as we're getting closer and closer to product launch. And hopefully next year at this time, you and I can be talking about the new product and how we can use it in our offices um, every single day on every single patient. The so great this, part this is will that test equally for whether it's HPV, oral pharyngeal, or oral cancer. Yep. And, yeah. And are, are the these CD are these different cancers to you? They're basically they're they're all tumor they're all tumors. Uh, the CD44 protein, which is the basis of Dr. Elizabeth Franzman's work. She's the oncologist, surgeon, uh, and faculty member at the University of Miami that basically identified the CD44 protein as, the, as the being indicating in every step of tumor genesis uh, in, in the uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma, no matter where it was located in the, oral, uh, or in the oral pharynx and in the oral cavity. So that was the interesting part. And then as she continued her studies and coupled it with this total protein component, when those two markers came together, she found that 25 times risk of having uh, oral squamous cell cancer than the average person uh, continued to <coughs> pop up in her studies. So these are all peer-reviewed uh, studies that have gone on over the years. And as we continue with our validation studies, we're hoping that uh, the FDA sees that this is a way to help you and I be more of the CSI dentists than we've ever been because we need to see this crime scene and investigate it properly so that this way we can help folks stay healthier now, and use our brain. Now, most of the technologies that you and I have lived through for oral cancer screening were just um, technologies from downstairs where they put toluene blue and we're looking for a change. That's basically PAPS. Right. That, that's basically uh, cervical uh, vaginal yep. techniques. Yep. And so, yep. so where's the status of the toluene blue? What, what, whatever. And the, there were, the belt, biggest, you know, different lights that you would shine. Lights are very helpful, and I still use a light every day because I don't have any other tools. And I think that as I work with the, with or, uh, Oncalert, which is the product name from Vigilant Biosciences, I'm going to be still using my lights simply because if my test shows me that there's proteins going on, that makes me want to look even closer. So I'm going to be using that until something better comes along for identification. And what but light are lights you using? Are important. I'm using, I've been using Velscope since its introduction years ago. I, I love that light. Uh, Oral ID is another great light. Uh, if you don't want to uh, invest in a Velscope, you want to get a good uh, light for visible fluorescence. Oral ID is a really good one, too. It's less expensive. Uh, it takes a little bit more uh, to understand how to work with it because you've got to put on a pair of glasses as well. But it's a really nice light as well. These, these are great mechanisms uh, that are available. But the problem with, with some of them are specificity and sensitivity. Uh, the biggest problem is false positives with most of these uh, other adjunctive tests that we're using today. Uh, if you don't, if you, if the, you don't cut down on the false positives 
uh, you really continue to have people questioning. Oral surgeons have been very resistant to uh, adopting a lot of the visible fluorescence because of the false, false positive circumstances. Uh, what OncAlert will be doing when, uh, in our test studies, we've shown that it's 88% uh, sensitive and 95% uh, specific, which means that it's only 5% false positive probability when you use OncAlert. So our ability to rule out healthy is extraordinarily good with the testing mechanism that Vigilant is putting together. But so John, it's well, really, really but John, how do how do I say I'm a doctor and a physician of the mouth and I can't give an HPV vaccine? I mean, and and should 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 dentists be talking to parents about getting their it, kids an HPV vaccine? What what are your thoughts on that? We can't even give influenza vaccines. The pharmacists can do that. Oh, not why the can't pharmacist, we do the that? pharmacy tech. The right, pharm exactly. The pharmacy tech so can give a flu shot why, and I can't. I agree with you 100%. I, it's, it's for some reason the dental boards out there don't think that you and I as doctors are able to inject in the pink skin, even though we in, – into this flesh skin, even though we give it injections into the pink oral cavity skin all the time is there essentially the training is, 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 is so small to be able to provide these types of vaccines. I'm on your, I'm on, I'm on your side. I think that it's kind of silly that it, we're not being able to do that. It, it's sad because um, they, they, the average American sees a dentist twice for every time they see a physician and, and the number of people that are killed each year from the flu when we could have been giving grandma and grandpa a flu shot is uh, exactly crazy. I and, agree. Uh, and the, HPV, and the HPV vaccine, I'm, you know, when you talk about it with parents, some people, some people um, don't like it because they, they believe in abstinence. They just don't, you know, they, they, they don't want to talk about birth control, condoms, HPV. They just say, you know, just abstinence. And, uh, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that but if, if it works. But if, if, they're, uh, if, if they're not abstinent, then it'd be nice if they had an HPV vaccine and, and understood that you need to have a condom on for, regular sex and oral sex. I mean, and, uh, I agree. and it's a conversation where a lot of dentists do not want to have that conversation for religious purposes. Yeah. But yep. so, so what would you tell the guy? Where, where do you draw the line between um, going to mass every Sunday? Uh, Cause you're Italian. That's, that means it's about 150% chance you're a Catholic. Uh, where, where do you draw the line between I'm a dentist and um, I fight disease versus I go to mass on Sunday and receive communion. Um, how, how do you, how do you, how do you navigate that? It's also it goes along with the vaccinations on the on the children that the parents were refusing to have them vaccinated for simple things like measles and mumps and stuff like that that created an entire uh, outbreak of of disease that shouldn't have. When do we start to look at things from a preventive basis, from a healthcare basis, from a public health basis versus? You know, again, not to get our religious folks upset, but, you know, religion's there as a guideline as well. It's a basis by which we try to live our lives. But if it starts to interfere with common sense, then I get a little bit concerned. So, yeah, vaccinations of whatever type, I think that they're smart. I think that since we can use an injection on a regular basis, you and I should be able to vaccinate when the time comes and, and, and in the appropriate manner. I think it's smart. Uh, being able to offer that to patients and uh, the children of the patients uh, that come in, why not? I think it makes sense. Uh, and John, we have I just, to move forward. Um, we're completely out of time. I'm two minutes over time. I got to wrap this up, but I, I just want to say that you know there are nine specialties recognized by the ADA, and everybody wants to talk about endo, perio, and uh, all the seven clinical. No one wants to talk about the little public health side. And at the end of the day, uh, we're a public health dentist, and we're in a community. And, and we, we treat the whole community. That means fluoridating the water. That means talking about prevention. That means, you know, oral cancer. You know, if, if we're, we're, a fireman doesn't say, I only do um, houses over 3,000 square foot. I don't do apartments and condos, and I don't go to trailer parks. You know, I mean, that, right. that's, that's not your job when you're a fireman. When you're, when you're a dentist, when you're a fireman, you put out the fire wherever it is. And when you're a dentist, you're a public health dentist from A to Z. Hey, John, you're the busiest man I know. Uh, thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. And thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Congratulations on your MAGD. Uh, congratulations on everything. And, uh, man, it was an awesome hour for me. I hope you had fun, too. It was a great pleasure and a great laugh. I enjoyed every second of it. I look forward to doing it again sometime. I hope so. You got to you got to promise me you're going to come back next year. If this gets a five ten release, you got to come back on and tell me all about it. 
You betcha. I uh, will do that. All right, Thank buddy. Thank you, Howard. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.